Hello, everybody. Welcome to another installment of Show to Be with Mike G, the show of life, the show of traveling the world on a boat, sipping beer, the show of engineering, the show of doing what you love and finding a way to share the passion. Today's guest as the second installment of Show to Be's Rum Week, coinciding with Texas Tiki Week, the father of the Ministry of Rum, the expert, the academic, Ed Hamilton today. A great chat recorded it some months ago, but learning about Ed's, gosh, tumultuous life, it's almost Hemingway-esque, working on oil rigs, working on boats, traveling the islands in search of brilliant rum. There's a wonderful website, Ministry of Rum, that came about. Also, Ed's looking forward to publishing more books about rum. He's unabashed, he's candid, and for those of us who've been in a room with him hearing him speak about rum, this is Rum 202, so to speak. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to share this conversation with Ed Hamilton. I try to show them other aspects of it that maybe they haven't considered. Right. And show them real transparency of a product. Mm-hmm. Uh, fermentation time and just throw that out there oh this one's fermented for 24 hours this is fermented for three days right and just kind of plant the seed that oh it makes a difference sure 24 i mean how do you get yeah a good nice fermentation no, 24 hours? you don't you don't you're using distiller's yeast which is fine well you're using distiller's yeast and then you're adding chemicals to speed it up and that's fine Sure. You need to do that, especially in the tropics, because you have other bacteria competing for the yeast and mm-hmm. for the sugar. But when you say or tell people, okay, there's differences in fermentation time, mm-hmm. hopefully the guy that thinks he knows it all goes, oh, well, why does that matter? That's right. Because they never thought maybe, about that. Right? right. And then maybe you say shorter fermentation time or longer fermentation time gives you a bigger depth of flavor. But you can also do that with yeast. Mm -hmm. And you're also competing with what they've been told or what they think they've learned from other brand ambassadors. Who, several of them, who have admitted to me, because I've said to them, where did this bullshit come from? And the guy goes, (laughs) oh, I wrote it. I wrote that. (laughs) Donald Trump that shit. Yeah. Just do it. Facts? What? Yeah, let's just deal with the facts. Yeah. And then I say, well, you, you used to sell wine, right? And the guy goes, yeah, how'd you know? I go, well, your whole pitch is a wine pitch. <laughs> and do you understand? Have you been to the distillery that you're talking about? Yeah. Because they don't do it like that. And then they go, oh, yeah, well, you know that. But, you know, they don't. What do they say? They don't, people don't care? Well, do they think they're not paying you attention? Know, or? They're being paid to give a pitch. Yeah. And I said, I don't want to call you out on it in public, right? but I am going to tell people that you probably heard this and this and this, but here's the reality. And, and I had this conversation with a guy tonight. We were talking about a, a particular product. Mm. And, Was it a rum or something? Yeah, yeah rum. And uh, we're talking about different kinds of cane. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, do you think they shut the distillery down or shut the the crushing process down when they buy cane and they have a bunch of different trucks coming in from all over an island to the distillery. Mm-hmm. Do you think they just shut it down and say, okay, well, today we're only going to do this certain kind of cane? Right. And he goes, yeah, I wondered about that. Because <laughs> it doesn't, that's not how it, it works. It doesn't make sense yeah. that you would do that. Logistically, and then the reality is, okay, a farmer shows up on Tuesday and he says, I've got, certain kind of cane and they know what kind you know they're looking at it mm. to you and i they all look the same but to the the guy that's buying the cane he looks at it and goes oh no this isn't the right kind of cane and the guy says okay 
So he goes down the road and sells it to the sugar factory. Where's he going to go with his next load of cane? Right. The sugar factory buys it without any bullshit. Right. Oh, you're on the wrong day. No, they do, they're not no. going to do that. He's they're not going to take the cane and they're going to crush it and they're going to shove it in with everything else. Absolutely. So is it, 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 and he's just like, all of a sudden there's this profound moment. He's like, oh, I never thought about this logically. Well, he says, I was concerned. I, he says, I, I wondered about that. It didn't make sense to me. And I said, well, no, it doesn't make sense. And it's basically marketing. Right. And then the other side of it is, how many farmers grow one crop? Oh, they'd be, they'd be out of a house and home. They have to diversify, obviously. So the single varietal stuff doesn't <laughs> add up. <laughs> right. And Does you think it really matters, ultimately? Like, is that one of the truest values in rum, that it's no, a single varietal? No, no, not at all. Distillers use different varietals, and, and we're talking about, I'm talking about Martinique Rum Agricole. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Nissan, which is recognized as the best on the island, mm. uses several different varietals, and they blend it like you would blend a fine wine. Right, right. They use different varietals or different species of cane. They're allowed to use 10, 12 different kinds of cane on mm-hmm. Martinique. To make rum, uh, they to make rum agricole to get the AOC mark and all that, but they use different kinds depending on the soil, right? The uh, drainage and flavor that they're looking for. Mm-hmm. But the primary thing is you want cane that will grow in your field, right? You got to because you want you want to do what you want to sell it. You got to grow cane. Yes, you got to you know. And this idea that, oh, we only use this kind of cane because it's the hardest to grow, but it's the best flavor. I go, I want to kick the guy that came up with that in the nuts. <laughs> was it really you? Did you really do that? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, that was me. And I said, okay, the next time I see you, I'm going to kick you in the nuts. <laughs> and he goes, and I deserve it. He said he knows. Yeah, right? he knows. It's bullshit, right? Yeah. You got to love that. Do you like that part, the, the kind of the tragic comedy of the industry? that uh, there's just People saying shit that makes no sense. Talking about spirits being smooth, right? Is there a column distilled? Right. All this bollocks, man. It's it's a load of shit. Well, I try to I try to show people. Another example was I was in a tasting today with a guy, and and he said a not we had a nine year. I'm sorry, we don't have any here. The samples are we met. Mm. Um, we had a nine year old or seven year old Saint Lucian cast cast strength pot still rum. Oh wow! The guy took a sip of it. Set it down, leaned back in his chair. He looked around, and he reached for it and took another sip. Mm. And a good spirit, if you put it at arm's length and it goes down your throat and you get the aftertaste, and it should invite you. It should demand that you take another sip. Yeah, I love it. And you say, wow, that was pretty good. But what was that in the mid-palate or the finish? Mm-hmm. Or, oh, I need another sip. And you want another sip because there was nothing in that first sip that was offensive. Right. And it finished nicely. And it made you curious. And it made you curious. And you could get all sexist if you wanted to equate that to looking at someone walking down the street. Sure. And they make you turn and look. Yeah, that's fair though. That whether it's that a, guy a guy or a guy or whether girl, you're or whatever. It's that it is. impulse. It's like there's something attractive and But there's something attractive there and I want to see more of this. Right. I want to learn more. I want to know more about this. Yeah. And you reach and you take another sip. And I watched this guy, he took four sips, and I said, You're not going to identify everything in that in four sips. Right. And he I said, add a little water. And he added just a little bit of water, which is a whole nother story. But mm. when you add water but he, he says, oh, man, it really opened up. And I said, yeah, and that's only 118 proof. Yeah. Don't put a lot of water in there. But just, just enough. Just a right. little bit of water. And he just opened his mind to it. And Well, he, would, he was a professional guy, but he's mm-hmm. like, wow. And I said, have you found that offensive flavor yet? That thing that says, I've right. had enough. Yeah. I don't need this. I don't want this anymore. Or the, the blemishes on the face. Right. right? The blemishes yeah. or the broken whatever. <laughs> or the kids. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, you're so beautiful. Yeah, I've got two kids. Well, 
See ya. And I've See got $12,000 of credit card debt, <laughs> and my car just got repossessed. <laughs> and yeah. You don't know the story keep, until you I know the story. I can't keep a job. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, the, everything goes downhill. Has it been a good trip thus far, though? Like uh, all the places you visited in Austin? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Austin's always good. I'm really lucky. I only go where I want to go. That's pretty good. Yeah, when, most people don't have that luxury. When I want to go. Yeah. Why? So why Why in early February? Was there something that came up? It's warm. It? Beautiful, right? It's not supposed to be warm, though. If you looked at the numbers, it's not. It's supposed to be cold right now. Well, that's you why just I, knew, didn't you? No, that's why I love Southwest Airlines. Because I can cancel this trip mm. the morning of the trip and get my money back. Ah, I And see. if it's going to be freezing and if there's an ice storm coming i'm not coming yeah no way and I, you know they understand that sure i was in florida last week and it was rainy and all that uh i had to see my folks who live in florida and uh, deal with a distributor down there mm. and, and i kept watching the weather and i said yeah austin's gonna be okay it's supposed to be cold at night but you know it'll yeah, be warm okay. during the day yeah, yeah it's great when you're out and about right yeah works and out perfect. today i brought a sweater i didn't need it uh, and you were no. uh, we were so I didn't know you were in town until Matt was telling me, because I talked to Matt all the time. Uh, brothers in arms, in a sense, right? Same distributor, talking right. all the time. And he's like, yeah, Ed's in town. I'm like, what? And actually, I didn't know, because I was at that event last night for the calendar. Cause I, I put that stuff together, and those are good friends. And it was, and I was like, is that fucking Ed Hamilton over there? Right? It's almost like during South by Southwest, you go to one of those music parties. Right. Like, is that Ben Stiller over there? <laughs> but, but given the audience, right. right? Just a bunch of bartenders. That was a really cool event. I was primarily anonymous, yeah, which I love being. It's six foot five. I'm anonymous. <laughs> you know, I just kind of blend into the crowd, right? But there are a lot of big guys there. Sure, yeah. Cosmos is pretty tall, I think. Yeah, he's pretty tall. But he was inside working most That's of the time. True. That's true. But I was outside and I heard people talking about rum uh-huh. and bars, and and several people said, "I love Hamilton rums. Have mm-hmm. you had the Hamilton rums? They're, you know." And I wanted to say, oh, which Hamilton rums? <laughs> because I've got a Jamaica and St. Lucian and, right, and the right. Demerara. And I just, you know, just took it in. And I said, that's fine. I'm glad they love them. It doesn't make you feel, though. It's got to be pretty it nice. It feels good. Right? It feels good. Um, I looked for holes in the market mm-hmm. in the available rum category. Right. There was not a 151 after Lemon Heart went away. Mm. Uh, there was not a Jamaican black. There is no other uh, pot still cast strength rum. Mm-hmm. So that's where I'm going to go. There you go. Uh, I don't know who said it, but I really adopted this as a marketing philosophy. Mm-hmm. Go where they aren't. That's great, yeah. Final, the, be the first. Space I mean, you did it with your gin. Yeah. You, you right. went where they weren't. Yeah, because they don't you care. You didn't try to make another London dry gin. No, who gives a shit? <laughs> right? I mean, well, I'm going to be the first to admit. Who cares? Well, there's already six of them there. Yeah, exactly. No, and... You went after a Texas because it's in a massive economy. So it's a massive economy yeah. that's very loyal to Texas. Absolutely, yeah. And somebody today was talking about, well, he doesn't make enough to expand and go to other states. And I said, he would be an idiot to go to another state yeah. until Texas is saturated and they're knocking at your door saying, please, 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 please. Then you go into the next state. Yeah. But I could almost guarantee you failure in California. Really? I haven't, I haven't looked at it much. What, what, what would you say? You're gonna sell it. You're gonna sell a Texas gin in California? You'd rebrand it. <laughs> no. So here's an interesting model. Here's something to think about. Because I talked talk to Nicholas Platz today, and he's like, "I want it, love it." I'm like, "Cool." And he goes, "I need a new. I need a different brand." I'm like, "Okay." And so then at that point. We realize this is like a Heaven Hill relationship or a Luxco kind of relationship, right? Where we're just making, we're enabling that distributor to have something that's a nice right. commodity for them. Right. And that's a weird model. It's like, because everybody's so brand centric, right? Well, I'm going to sell my brand to Diageo. I'm going to sell Angel's Envy to Bacardi. Wh- whatever. Whatever your play is, right, right. go past it because that area is done. There's, I think it's all pretty much cleaned out. Besides the guys maybe that have been around a, a really long time. But Diageo is on the record as saying they're not trying to acquire more companies. You're trying to, well, not companies, but craft distillers necessarily, right? Yeah, but anybody that believes. That's <laughs> what they say. Well, <laughs> I've seen some big shifts in Diageo yeah. in the last 10 years. 
and uh, it's very cyclic. Yeah. And uh, certainly, you know, you don't you don't want to necessarily be bought by Diageo. You don't right. necessarily want want to be bought by Bacardi. But there are private equity people, Wall Street people, that are looking at and saying, "Wow, craft spirits! Oh, right. I could start something." But these guys are smart enough to say, "Well, why do I want to start something? Why don't I buy a brand that's already reached uh, critical mass?" Right. Yeah. And what do you consider critical mass to be? That's right. That's a good question. I mean, I don't. What is critical mass at the point where you have to invest? So you talked about kind of upkeep and the management and the maintenance of a distillery and just walking away because there's so much that has to be done. Maybe that's critical mass where like, uh, you know, I well, can't Well, in the industry, this. kind of a, a rough, you know, pull a number out of your ass number yeah. is 10,000 cases. Gotcha. Once you're at 10,000 cases nationally, uh, you start to gain people's attention. Mm-hmm. But that's a real pull a number out of your ass number. It's a lot of numbers. It's a, it's a big, big number. number. It's, number. Really it's a big, big number. Yeah. I think you can do it with a lot smaller number case sales. Mm. But I look at what is sustainable. Mm-hmm. And certainly with my, my rums, under my, my Hamilton rums, uh, I feel like I'm sustainable now. Yeah. I'm selling enough that I can pay the bills, I can order more. I'm not freaking out or sweating every time I put out a purchase order for more product right. and say, am I going to be able to sell enough of this to pay the bills on this, mm-hmm. pay the bottling? But I'm looking at a four or five month lead time, yeah. which is that's That's tough. There's a long stuff time. Ch- yeah, forecast, forecast a new product five months out, Yeah, four months out. My Demerara rums that I sourced from DDL, uh, I got them into the market. They got into my warehouse January 8th of last year, Mm -hmm. January 7th, 7th or 8th. The next day, I put in an order for my next batch of rum. Because you knew it would just be that quarter away, right? I knew it was going to be a quarter away, and I couldn't afford to run out. So I said... Took a deep breath and <laughs> said, here we go. Uh, and hopefully in 30 days, my distributors are going to pay me. Right. And the first the shipment will be in more than 30 days away. Mm-hmm. Because when the shipment came in, I was up for oh, about $57,000 federal excise tax. Yeah. And That's as you wild. know, do not pass go. Right. And if you do not pay that, you're out of business. Yep. That's the end of the game. Game over, right. as they say. So... You better have the money when it comes in, you know, as as things progress, mm. and uh, it's a significant amount of money. I mean, that's, that's a just lot. yeah, that's that's a small part of what it takes to do a batch of rum, right? Uh, bottles, labor, and it's all. Is it all case backed and bottled by the time it hits customers? No, no, no. I bring in bulk rum and I bottle in upstate New York. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, so I pay the federal excise tax, but I've already paid for the rum pay for the federal excise tax, and I pay for the bottles, labels, mm. capsules, and labor, and then then it goes into the warehouse, and I start attracting more bills. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, God, I hate putting closures on. It's like my least favorite thing, man. Uh, well, like they'll, sometimes they'll leak. Sometimes they'll be a half a millimeter off. All of that shit. Then it gets hot in our like Texas warehouse. Then all of a sudden they pop up. Like just, the Capsules are the worst thing ever. Yeah, but what you going to do? What you going to do? That's, what that you gonna it. do? Exactly. What's my? You gonna put a screw top on this thing and make it look cheap? Oh, no, you can't. And a screw cap takes a machine, right? And it's a one at a time machine. Mm-hmm. Or it's big production. Yeah. And nobody will do a thousand cases. A thousand cases in an automated system is nothing. Right. They won't even set up for a thousand cases. You're talking about a system, an automated system that'll run. 1,500 cases an hour. Right. They're not going to set that up. For what? It takes six hours to set it up and tear it down. To run for, what, 20 minutes? 45 minutes or 40 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. They're not going to do that. So you're... You left your own devices. You left your own devices, exactly. And that's good. It's a good lesson to... I mean, until... I think it's something you and I can appreciate. You don't appreciate it until you've done it. That's exactly right. Until you fermented and smelled and get... 
get your hands all stained. I mean, like that's the stuff that, that really makes it valuable, you know? Yeah, I'm lucky that I have been able to experience a lot of this uh, through my visits to distilleries over the last 20 years. Yeah. And as an engineer, I saw a lot of problems, identified a lot of problems that were potentials. Not that I was looking to do this 20 years ago, but right. uh, an example is labels. Mm -hmm. uh, for my Jamaican rum, the distiller said, well, send us your labels. And I said, I can't send you labels. I said, first, they're heavy. Yeah. It costs a lot to get them out there. It costs a lot to get them, and they're not going to fit your machine. Right. So I want to buy them from your label manufacturer, except your label manufacturer is some guys in Barbados that I will never do business with. Mm -hmm. They're crooks? No. Just not quality stuff? Uh, they're just guys that I'm not going to do business with. Got it. Uh, I've known them for many, many years, mm -hmm. and... They've jerked me around. Shame and, on you, shame on me thing. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. Uh, my first bottling of La Favorite rum, uh, the, bo the labels were coming from Nissan, and I said, they will be, I said, I, I waited months to get them. And finally I went to the distillery and I said, look, uh, September 27th, I believe, was a Monday. And I said, if... These aren't ready to go on Monday. Mm. I'm canceling the order. Wow. It was on the previous Thursday, Wednesday. Friday, two guys came with suitcases from Barbados with the labels. Amazing. And they got the job done. And I said, wow, guys, you can do it. <laughs> I was, it was a test. It was all a big mess. <laughs> no. Well, the, the uh, particular day was my birthday. And I said, I'm not going to go past my birthday. Yeah, it's your birthday. This is going to be done. I've been waiting 18 months to have this done. You guys are between me and getting this going. Right. And also September, end of September, so I ship. It's not going to be in my warehouse till November. Mm -hmm. i got to have it ready for January. Yeah. To go hit the streets. And I expected to have it earlier, but, you know, one thing after another and after another. So I just wrote them off, and, and they wanted me to give them an intro to all of the other distilleries in uh, the French islands. They hadn't stuff. been able to penetrate that market. Yeah. And so they came, and, you know, and oh, Ed, good to see you and all this. And I, I'd known these guys for years, right. being in Barbados and other things. And so I said, guys, you don't get it, do you? You like, didn't deliver what you told me you were going to deliver. Even though ultimately they delivered something, right? Ultimately they did. But not. In but the, I said, I had to threaten to cancel the order, so I'm not going to introduce you to my friends. Yeah, you guys are fuck-ups, basically. Basically. And, oh, Ed, don't say... I said, I will never buy a, another label from you. Oh, Ed, don't say that. And I said, oh, sorry, my English, not so good. <laughs> I will never buy another label from you. Wow. And I haven't, and I won't. It's amazing. Well, that's good. I mean... So when, it, when the Jamaican distiller says, oh, we get our, our labels from Barbados, I said, nope, I'm not going to deal with them. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, they're horrible. I go, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course they're horrible. Well, of course they're horrible. But then the other challenge is the label has to fit their machine. Right. Which is spooling, and that's all like a whole other thing. A whole other cut. Thing. And, right. Yeah. So I've been in a number of distilleries, and I've seen labels sprawled all over the floor. Right. Labels we think of being cheap. They're not cheap. They're not cheap. You're talking forty to fifty, sixty cents a piece. Right, right. Because it's front and back and mm -hmm. embossed and all these other things, cut and die cut and all these. Yeah. Things. So oil. Yeah. Yeah. So I said no, I'm not going to do that. And I said, let me tell you what would happen if I send you labels, and I come down there in six months. Those lovely ladies that are in that bottling mm -hmm. warehouse are going to say, here's that. A white boy, <laughs> right, right, with his labels, yeah, that don't fit right? our bottle, yeah. And he says, "Yep, that's what <laughs> so what, happened." Why would he? Why did, he, did, did the conversation end at that point? Yeah, yeah, and I, I said, do it, right? and I said, "Okay." And then I found out that, uh, in particular, in the Jamaican rum, I found out that it was a blend, and I talked about doing an aged rum. But then I found out that it was a blend of light, very light, and heavy rum. Mm -hmm. And I said, perfect. 
let's adjust the amount of the heavy rum, mm -hmm. give me a different blend, sell it to me in bulk, I'll ship it up to New York and bottle it. Interesting. I pay for pallet tanks, yep. WC tanks, That's, which are expensive. Uh, 270 gallons, 1170? Yeah, 1,000 liter. 1,000 liter, okay. And I pay 450 bucks a piece for them, which is a pretty big hit because they have to import them and then right. You saying duty. just just shipping is 450 a piece? No, well I buy them from the D Jamaican distillery. I see. At 450, but anyway I ship them up and then I resell them for 100 bucks. Right. And, and they're already proofed to your liking, right? You don't mess with the proof. No, no, I I proof you do it proof in the U.S. Too? Oh shit. Okay. So yeah, you know no. all. So you know a lot more about the difficult parts of this. Oh yeah. No, no. Then I think engineer. I think a lot of people realize. Yeah. Uh, and that's another story. But anyway, uh, by bringing it to New York, I have quality control right. over the bottling process, mm -hmm. and I have several different brand or several different products under the Hamilton brand, different labels. But when you put them on a shelf, they're all lined up. Mm -hmm. If I had these bottled in different places, be disparate, disparate. They'd brand, be. Right? Oh man, come on! There, it's only an eighth of an inch. Well, only an eighth of an inch doesn't look so bad. Except this one's up an eighth, and that one's down. Now we're talking right. a quarter. Zigzag. Yeah. Zigzag, rather. Really. And so that's that's one of the things for the bottling, for the appearance of it. Right. But when I first met the the, the uh, bottler uh, Mario Maza, his first question to me was, "How long do we have to dilute this spirit?" Mm -hmm. And I said, "Well, how about five, six, seven days." He says, perfect. He says, I don't want to just dump water in there. That's not good. I said, yeah. And, <laughs> and just see what happens, right? Yeah, I said, that's good. And we agree on that. And he had told me he was a chemical engineer, and he'd been in the wine business with his father. Mm. His father owned a winery, and then he went to Australia, did some work, came back, and now was running the operation. And his father was a little older than me, not yeah. much older than me. Um, but he understood what it takes to proof a spirit right and that's something that a lot of people don't do properly well absolutely lots of studies done and people are off wildly one of the things that i i've got a 151 and an 86 that are the same product mm -hmm. different proof same i use consistent water across mm -hmm. all my products but is it uh ro or anything yeah it's ro after well water it's well water and then it's ro got it okay uh, they talked about filters, and finally I said, well, show me the filter. Mm -hmm. And they showed me an RO machine. I said, I've built RO machines and yeah. done all kinds of stuff on boats in the islands. You need RO water. Right. And he says, oh, you know RO? And I said, yeah. So why didn't you just tell me this is RO? And he goes, well, most people don't know RO. And I said, well, okay. okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. And so I use a uh, half micron filter on the water. Half micron, okay. And I do a... I try to do a five micron on the actual spirit. Right. Because you want to take too much out, right? Right. Particularly on the uh, uh, aged spirits, like yeah. the St. Lucian pot still. The Jamaican doesn't matter. Uh, small. But it turns out that they use a lot of two micron filters, and they buy them by the case. Okay. So a five micron filter is more expensive. I see. I said, okay, two microns okay. Yeah. But we agree on what it's going to be. Right. And that's what it is. Um they are very particular about how long it takes. They drip the water in. They circulate it. Really? So uh, fully, fully uh, basically get it uh, integrated. Right, word, right, right. Fully integrate it. And they will circulate it overnight. Mm -hmm. They'll drip water in, part of the water that they want to put in. And then they'll circulate it for 24 hours and then add more water over a period of several days. Yeah. And uh, I've been... I've, very happy with the results. Well, so a lot, a lot of people are really happy with those <laughs> yeah. results. So that's so, maybe why we're here, right? So, <laughs> so something, you know. I mean, this all sounds like a bunch of bullshit sitting here talking about it, but it's I, important. It's well, not, I tell you, know? you can demonstrate it. Yeah. Very simply, I tell bartenders: here's the 151, here's the 86. They're in the same glass or two different glasses in front of you. Mm. Pour some of your water into the 151. Mark it with a pen or, you know, look at it and say, okay, it's almost twice. It's a little less than twice. Right. So it's going to be less than twice the height here. Dump water in it 
and try to approximate the flavor of that 86. Yeah. And what you find is it's not as bright. Mm. It almost tastes dull, if you can imagine that. Yeah, uh, yeah, in, oh, sure. In a flavor. Um, and when then when you taste the 86, you go, oh. And then you show yourself that, yes. And in cocktails, many times people will say, oh, yeah, we we'll just use less 151. Mm-hmm. In, I feel like I'm getting through to people and people are expanding themselves. I'm in new markets and all these kind of things. Yeah. I'm not too analytical or anal about it. But in December, I shipped more 86 than I did 151. Really? For the first month. Interesting. Okay. And uh, I got an order tonight for uh, more 86. I don't remember the exact numbers. It was something like uh, 12 cases of 151 mm. and 27 of the 86. Oh, wow. So two, roughly two to one. Yeah. That's amazing. But uh, it was re- made my day. Yeah. Well, so, you know, this is the thing. Like, I catch lots of people in what may be considered their heyday, right? But this seems like probably the second, third career for you because obviously you have a big background in engineering in some sense. No one talks about micron filtering. This is the first time I've talked about <laughs> although I'm absolutely You know familiar. what microns are, I yeah. certainly do, yeah. So where, where did you start? Where did you grow up? Are you a West Coast guy? East no, Coast I grew or? up in Florida. Florida? And uh, Where about in Florida? Just south of Tampa. Well, kind of all over Florida, but I mm. uh, went to school in Tampa. And uh, met a guy there that was building a, working on a 24-foot boat, rebuilding mm-hmm. it in Tampa. And I grew up sailing and was interested in sailing. It's like a, did your father or something, was he into sailing? Uh, people around my father and people, you know, we were on the coast. Yeah. And uh, I said to this guy, so where are you going? And he goes, well, I don't really know yet. <laughs> well, that's a good answer. I like that. And he says, you know... You can go anywhere. I, yeah, I know you can go anywhere in a sailboat. But he he said something that really hit me. He says, "It's less than, or it's the the longest distance between land masses between here and South America mm-hmm. is eighty miles. That's it. That's it. That seems real feasible." Yeah, until you get out there in a twenty-four foot boat. Sure, not not the reality of it, but just on the on the on paper, it looks pretty good. It looks pretty good. Uh, San Antonio's what yeah. seventy-five miles? Yeah, roughly the same. You can walk it. Sure, take you a while. Take you a while. But you can walk it. You know, if you don't see any rattlesnakes or it doesn't get too hot or yeah. too cold or yeah, but it's it's a very reasonable goal, right? And so I. Started, you know, I looked at a map and I went, well, yeah, of course, you're right. And then later on, um, when I started sailing it, I, I, it stuck in my mind. And, uh, that particular actually, number? Yeah, yeah, actually, it's a little more than that. It's about 87 miles, I think it is. Mm. I'd have to look at a chart exactly, but between Grenada and uh, Trinidad. Got it, okay. But um, I should know exactly what it is, and I don't know right now. Uh, but I've sailed that many, many times. That whole... 87, roughly, yeah. miles. Yeah. I mean, I've been in, checked in and out of Trinidad more than a dozen times. Really? Yeah, probably 15, 20 times. When did Closer you first start sailing? Like, how about how old were you when you started sailing? 10. 10. Oh, so way back. When was that first? How old were you when you made that first trip out there? Uh, well, I bought my first boat in 84. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got really lucky. I graduated college right after the Vietnam War. Or the did, Vietnam where, War was still around, 76. 76. Where did you go to school? University of South Florida in mm. Tampa. Okay. Now they have the Brahmins, and, and back then they said, we'll never have a football team. Right, right. I haven't seen the stadium, but now there's a football now team. That's where the money is, right? Yeah, that's where the money Go where the money is. That's yeah, true. And uh, anyway, I graduated, went to, went, got up to Chicago and started working for a company. Were you so, the chemical engineering? Yeah, okay. chemical and mechanical. And... Uh, I was working for a company that was selling electromechanical actuators Mm -hmm. that went on what they called back then uh, smart bombs. Uh, Yeah, you might have heard of tow missiles or cruise missiles. Yeah, oh, right, right. Cruise missiles. Now we call them weapons of mass destruction. That's right, yeah. These were were nuclear warhead (laughs) stuff. So you had your your place. And so then when you're going up to Chicago, so that is still towards the end of the... Vietnam War, is that you're saying, or is it well, seventy eight? The Vietnam War was over. Over by that point, it was right essentially now. over. But 
we were still in something of a cold war and yeah. there was still a lot of demand for these things. But uh, I was with my boss, uh, Fred Kermansky, and we were cramped up in an air. I was cramped up in an airplane. I was in the middle seat. Because you're six five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I'm going to say I don't experience the same yeah. level of discomfort on a flight. But yeah, and the guy next to me in the window was smoking. Back then, you could smoke on airplanes. Mm-hmm. And Fred says, "You know, Ed, you don't seem happy." So what do you mean I'm not happy? Uh, I'm with you, my favorite boss. We're off to go <laughs> sell some more. Uh, components to make some more bombs and kill some more people. Right. That but, sounds pretty lovely. This is pretty good. <laughs> is it going to get better? I'm, I'm all ears. <laughs> and uh, Fred says, well, what do you want to be doing in five years? Write it down. Mm. So I got out a piece of paper, and got my bag down from the overhead, and kicked him a couple of times sure, that's what as he I gets. crawled over. Can you put him. effort onto the plane? Yeah. Well, he was... He was probably 6'2". Okay. So, so he wasn't a small guy at all, you know, and, and so I'd climb over him, and uh, and we were drinking scotch. Back then, we drank scotch all the time on the mm. company's bill, and uh, the flight attendant said, oh, excuse me, could we get a couple more drinks here, you know, one for me and one for my boss, and got my piece of paper and wrote down, go sailing. And he says, now, don't show me. Now, write down five things you're going to do starting today mm. to make that happen. Are you I, in your early 20s then? Yeah. Yeah, try to frame it. Okay. And I wrote, I quit and handed it to him. And he says, Ed, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 you can't quit. And uh, what you just said, like, you know. So I put my arm around him and kind of gave him a headlock and pulled him over to me and kissed the top of his head and yelled, I love you, man. You saved my life. 1978, guys didn't do that on airplanes. No, they didn't. <laughs> no, they didn't. <laughs> Probably 77, yeah, 78. So I quit. On the flight? It, on the flight. And I, we went around for three days because we had reservations. Right. And, you know, we did our business. Was he pissed? Trip. Well. It's kind of his fault in the way he invoked yeah, it. Yeah, he? he was kind of like, how am I going to explain this to the boss? That I encouraged my guy to have that, some self-actualization. And then and he quit. quit. Right. And so today when <laughs> Motivation I Motivation technique gone wrong. Just right, got to tell right, you, right? Right. This didn't work out the way it was supposed to. And I'm sure he had been told by his boss, hey, you know, go out with Ed and, you know, make this, you know, sort this out. Yeah. So every time he would object, I would walk over to him and grab him in a headlock and kiss him and yell, I love you, man. And uh, a good way to defuse a conflict. (laughs) Yeah, well, doing it in front of military defense contractors Ah. was a little out of place, inappropriate behavior, Mm -hmm. I guess. They weren't used to seeing guys kissing in lobbies of defense contractors either. Right. I don't remember exactly where we were. But anyway, the trip was three days. I got back and uh, left the company and went to California. A friend of mine uh, had interviewed and had been accepted by TRW and had an apartment in uh, Playa del Rey, uh, just south of Marina del Rey. Oh, yeah. So we moved out there, and uh, I was shocked at the rents and all those kind of things. But Mm. I spent a little bit of time there. And I ran into a guy named Wendell Rankin who was building yachts in Taiwan. And he introduced me to some other people, and I ended up working for a timeshare yacht company and ended up going to Taiwan and building boats. And that company went bankrupt, and so I was... Like in the capacity of building boats, are you you doing the design work and kind of... Well, they had a basic boat, but I had a punch list of about 175 things. Gotcha. And Wendell, to to give him credit, uh, he was such a great guy that... uh, I spent a day with him, a day and a half with him. Ripped his boats apart, the boat that he had, was trying to sell. He had mm-hmm. one there in Marine Del Rey. Had 175 things wrong with the boat, wow. and the guy still liked me. <laughs> <laughs> was it safe enough to sail before yeah, you Yeah, it was to? safe enough to sail, but there were problems. Yeah. There were things. And, uh, you know, maintenance things and things that should be done better, easier, right. you know. So... Anyway, uh, ended up in Taiwan. The company went bankrupt, and I left Taiwan. I mm. closed out the company bank account and went sailing. Sailing. Uh, At, like, out from, from Taiwan? From out? Taiwan. Went Where's to Hong Kong. Hong Kong, okay. And then 
the guys that I was sailing with said, hey, uh, you got a little bit of cash in your pocket. I didn't have much. But he says, you know, we're going on to Singapore and then to oh, wow. Mediterranean. We're going to go sail this boat. We'll see fit to take you on as crew if you want to continue. What kind of, are we talking a yacht still or something 47, more? 47 foot catch. Okay. Uh, leaving Taiwan, they said, well, we charge $5 a day for crew. Mm-hmm. And they had done this a few times. They'd moved boats and bought them and they were buying boats and taking it somewhere and then selling it. Right. And I said, tell you what, I'll pay you $10 a day when we get to Hong Kong if I don't pull my weight. Okay. We got to Hong Kong and they're like, oh, Ed. Uh, <laughs> Do you want to be captain? Then? First, first, let's buy you a beer. <laughs> no, I, they didn't offer me to be captain. Uh, they, one of them was a, an engineer on ships, mm. and the other had been running uh, U.S. flagged medical ships into Vietnam, oh, wow. carrying arms during the Vietnam War. It's an interesting intersection, though, right? You're kind yeah. of working in arms, you're yeah. doing similar things. So. Anyway, I, I sailed with them uh, to Singapore, and then we went down through the Philippines. Mm. Excuse me. Through the Philippines. About six months later, we ended up in Singapore. And my first night in Singapore, uh, ashore, I got hired off a bar stool no shit. to run a supply boat back to Manila. Wow. And I was like, oh, yeah, I love Manila. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was pretty good. Is this and, the Mel DeMarcos days, too? Like, uh, yeah, it was, this was uh, actually Marcos was still in power. Uh, basically, the only rule in the Philippines is that at that time was don't say anything bad about Marcos. Yeah, and then you're good, right? And you were good. And uh, the peso was losing ground against the dollar. Mm. And uh, San Miguel beers were 10, 15, 12 cents, about 12 cents at the mm. time. At the depth of their currency, it was down to about a nickel. Oh, wow. So it was a pretty good time yeah. to be a 25-year-old guy. In, yeah. In Buy Manila. what? <laughs> Buy it all. Who cares? Yeah. Well, and there's a lot of other uh, sorted things that are available, as I imagine. And Yeah, it was, it was a good time to be there. Yeah. Uh, and then I ended up looking around the oil fields, and I said, who's got the best job? And everybody said, Slumberger. And the next time I got back to Singapore... Um, I got hired out of another bar to go work for Slumberger. How does that work? You just having a beer, having a scotch, and people Basically, come in and talk? Basically, yeah, it, it, this is going to sound very racist, but uh, there were a lot of Texas guys, or you know, Americans around, right, and, right. and Europeans, and that kind of thing. It's, but, a, it's, a, very, it's a huge expat community there. Right. Was, was at that time. Mm. Uh, Indonesia had just relaxed their... Big mistake, as they called it. Back in the 70s, they, uh, with the, the big oil companies, Exxon and those guys, right. uh, maybe it was Chevron or Exxon, uh, had spent like a billion dollars, which was an unheard of amount of money yeah. on exploration. And they had developed all kinds of fields in Sumatra and, and identified all kinds of fields. Mm. And then the Indonesian government said, oh, uh, sorry, we or you didn't know, read the contract, uh, there's 100% duty on all the oil that leaves Indonesia. Wow. Everybody packed up and went home. Yeah, of course. <laughs> the billion quickly turns into half a billion, right? Right, or uh, half a bi- million. Yeah. So about 1980, uh, I was in Singapore, and they had just opened up like that weekend before. And so Indonesia had just opened up... Uh, Reduced their tax, everybody came back in, mm-hmm. and they were hiring people. Just left and right. Just grabbing people. Right. So I was an American. If you could speak English, that was a big plus. Mm-hmm. Engineering degree? Done deal. It was done. They'll put a ring on it right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I had heard Slumberger, so I, I talked to one guy, and uh, he was Slumberger, and then it found out that there's many different divisions of Slumberger. Mm-hmm. And what I didn't want to be in was the cement pumping version of Slumberger. Mm-hmm. I ended up working on wireline and ran around. It was it was the best job on the oil rigs. It's amazing. And so I did that for three and a half years. So just you, you, wherever you go, it works out. It seems like. Yeah. 
I think a lot of it is having the confidence to know that you can do this. Yeah. And later on, uh, a friend of mine told me something that I'll get to in a bit, minute, but uh, there were, it was, a, it was a good time to be in Asia mm. and to be an expat. I would not have wanted to be in Singapore as a Filipino looking for a cooking job on a rig or something like that. Right. Not to say there weren't jobs and, they, and most of the rigs hired Filipinos or mm. Thai. But it was a very different economy for different people. Right. And having an engineering degree really has been the best thing that ever happened to me. Did you ever think it would be that, that marketable? No, no. Just did it. To and I thought I'd end up as an engineer and, you know, get married and have 3.2 kids and live in a house and have right. a mortgage and drive an Did the, any of that happen? No, nah, it didn't happen. Not in this slightest. <laughs> <way. laughs> Maybe in my next life. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it worked out pretty well. And then I was in Papua New Guinea working on a rig, exploration rig. Mm. And to get to the third exploration rig in Papua New Guinea, you flew to the first exploration rig, okay. marked by a helicopter crash. From there over a mountain to the second rig site marked by a helicopter crash, mm -hmm. which was an absolutely beautiful place. Uh, there was a uh, beautiful valley and a river Very running through green, right? green and all that. But the river disappeared. River is quarter of a mile wide and it disappears into a sinkhole. What? And there's a uh, looked like steam or you know smoke. Uh, right, right. You know, like a waterfall. You huh? know, the top of a waterfall. You see the vapor. But it just disappeared into the earth. And uh, well, the earth is porous in that area, a lot mm. of limestone and that kind of thing, which was also good. The formations were also good for oil and that mm. kind of thing. Well, they they told us we were on a, an oil rig, but actually they were drilling for gas. Oh. It's a whole different, thing, different right? deal. Yeah. And after six weeks out and out there, two different trips out, I was working, I was living in, uh, Perth, Australia, mm -hmm. and working in Papua New Guinea. How long is that commute? Jeez. What, 14, 15 hours? Nah, it wasn't that bad. It was, was that bad? Well, the plane wasn't 14 hours, but it took over a day to get there. Got it, okay. You had to fly across Australia, mm -hmm. which is a huge country. Yeah. Uh, they they charter a, a Learjet, and we flew to Alice Springs, the capital of Australia, and then up to the east coast, up near the Great Barrier Reef can't think of the name of the town at this point but uh, anyway there was a, a small town yeah uh with an airport and then we flew from there by commercial plane to uh port moresby from port moresby it was about a two-hour flight by another commercial plane so hop, to a place hop. called hari spend the day there and then you get in line and weather permitting you go on well, I said, you know, I really don't need to be in the third rig site marked by a helicopter crash. <laughs> so uh, I left the company. And uh, five years and two months after I had quit my job with Fred Kramansky, I sure. bought a 38-foot sailboat and headed for the islands. Where were you and, living then? California? Back to California? Uh, back in Florida. Florida, okay. And bought a little uh, boat and went sailing. And didn't really know where I was going, didn't really know what I was going to do other than I wanted to have a good time and yeah. enjoy myself and stay out of jail. So here's a question about this, because I haven't spent a tremendous amount of time on, on a sailboat. What is the meal? What's the thing that you eat a lot of on a sailboat? Because it's got to not be that perishable, right? Yeah, rice. Rice? No. Uh, beans? But, stuff like cans? Yeah, stuff? Yeah. yeah, not too much cans. Some cans, but not too much. Beans, rice, but then fresh fish, yeah. obviously, in the Bahamas. You, you, Fishing a lot, obviously. Yeah, and going down through the Bahamas, you would anchor and stay in a place. And I'd work. I was building docks and doing refrigeration on boats wow. and doing all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But uh, you would go out and dive and eat fresh fish and lobster and oh, conch. Man. And uh, you know, rice lasts a lot longer than potatoes. Yeah. So rice was a big part of it. But I'd spent time in asia and lo learned to love rice learned how to pick rice and you know really it? yeah there's a lot of different on. kinds of rice there's a lot of jeez yeah it's, it's not just rice but uh something that i 
learned and I saw and observed, I never met a starving sailor. That's profound, actually. I never even thought about that. Yeah. Starving in their soul or literally starving? Starving, well, I, mean, I met guys in everywhere I went, in Hong Kong or Port Moresby. Uh, I went to the local dock or the yacht club if there was. And when I say yacht club, I mean, we're talking about a beer hall. Yeah, I was going to say, you didn't have that <laughs> fancy hat on. Yeah, no, a place, a place with beer <laughs> and rum. And, uh, you know, there were people who, these, I, I observed people didn't have money yeah. to speak of, but they had enough for a beer, and uh, there was always work to do. Somebody had something for them to do. Right. And I kind of took it to heart that, yeah, I didn't need a lot. I needed to stay out of jail. Mm-hmm. Which and, you said was challenging at times. Well, it was opportunities to get, <laughs> you know. Oh, that's right. <laughs> to, do, to do things. A lot of illicit substances, suffice it In to the say, islands, right? yeah, yeah, there were. Uh, but the idea that you can always make something happen. Mm-hmm. And if you've got a week's worth of food on your boat, and I generally kept more than that, but you know, maybe a month's worth of food. Mm-hmm. But if you've got enough food, what else do you need? That's right. Good food, food and a good anchor. Yeah. And then if Some you're booze, though, I would imagine, right? Oh yeah, but that yeah. was you know that was. <laughs> so I got to St. Thomas and Crucian Rum was a dollar ninety nine. Wow. And I just come from Puerto Rico, seventeen miles away, downwind. Mm-hmm. And uh, Don Q was nine dollars a bottle in the mm-hmm. little resort island I'd been. Didn't take me too long as an engineer to figure out that you know, if I put twenty cases of rum on this boat, mm-hmm. I can sail it back and make a little bit of money. And I don't have to work for a few months. Interesting. Where, so were you, you were bringing it into what market? Back into, into Florida? Co- no, into Calabria, Puerto Rico. Oh, uh, okay, Puerto Rico. Which uh, Puerto Rico is twelve hundred miles from Miami. That's so a long, long way. way. Yeah, but. I did it a few times, and I said, you know, you can't do this all the time. You're going to get in trouble or something. Yeah, and you only have so much space, right? Right. But uh, for many years, I was living on $50 a week. Wow. And I remember sitting on John Smith's boat, a wooden boat, building Kariku in the 60s. And he says, yep, if I had 50 bucks a week. The number again, right? And all of us, uh, there were half a dozen of us sitting there on the boat. And uh, we all said, yeah, yeah, we had 50 bucks a week. We'd be fine. We're done, right? We're done. Our boats are paid for. Yeah. Uh, you know, we weren't living high life. We weren't going to restaurants. We weren't going to bars. We didn't need to. Yeah. We were sitting there outside the bridge in St. Martin, hanging a line over, catching little fish that we were throwing on the grill. Mm-hmm. And that was dinner, drinking some rum. And... Uh, Friends were working on charter boats, and at the end of the day on the charter boats, instead of taking the extra beer and sandwiches ashore, Mm -hmm. they'd come by and throw it on the deck, and then they'd drop the boat off at the dock, and uh, on their way back to their own boats, they were living on boats, they'd come by and have a sandwich and a beer, and you know, it was a a community. It's it's, a very... Idealistic. uh, Yeah, well, it's literary (laughs) too, right? Right. I mean... It's pretty cool. It's a ton... Any squalls? I mean, there's got to be some conflict here, right? Besides maybe the... Oh, yeah, uh, hurricanes. <laughs> right? I've heard of those. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was, you know, you'd do this... I was moving a lot more than a lot than some people. Mm. But the idea was look at what you can do what you instead of what you can't do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you put together this great recording system... And you did it by saying, what can I do with what I got? Right, yeah. And, MacGyver stuff. I right, <laughs> right. And, oh, well, that didn't work. Okay, well, you know, try this. And so many times we look at what we can't do. Right. So. And we let that, I, I think that fear comes into play, right? Fear of uh, failing. And thus, we don't ever take that plunge. And that's why so many people really never come into their own and never... Right, feel comfortable innovating, or starting their own company, which I think is the, one of the quintessential characteristics you have to have is don't give a shit, just do it. Well, you have to care. Well, you sure, to you got to care, but you have to care, but don't care too much about right. the facts. You know, don't don't be afraid to fail. Right, and what is going to go wrong, and then 
look at others and what have they failed to do. Mm -hmm. um, I made a living for many years fixing refrigerators on boats. Yeah. And it was shocking to me that I worked on boats where the guy that owned the boat uh, was a uh, diesel mechanic. Yeah. He could tear that diesel engine apart and put right. it back together and do yeah. everything about it. But that refrigerator was magic. And <laughs> don't <laughs> mess with it. <laughs> and so he would pay me to fix the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And I, I would do it. Um, I was smuggling ROM. I was smuggling note cards, mm. artist stuff between the islands. And, and then something else I learned was everybody always wants something they don't have. Right. So I wouldn't say I, I live to capitalize on that. But I looked at, <laughs> you know, what is, what is missing here? What do people need? Yeah. And... I made some bad decisions. I bought things that I got to the next island, and they said, "Oh yeah, we've got that, and it's cheaper." Mm. And I'm like, "Oh man, yeah. okay, okay." You know, and I didn't have a lot of money, but there were opportunities, mm -hmm. and I looked for opportunities. And then uh, one day, I came up with the idea that I was going to sail south and visit all the distilleries, and I, I was really intrigued. Why was Crucian a dollar ninety nine and Don Q was nine dollars? Right, and then I was buying other rums in St. Thomas. And I was paying seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. I remember one time I paid twenty one dollars for a bottle of Barcelo from Dominican Republic, mm. and I looked at well, there is no correlation, or what is the correlation between quality yeah, and dollars? Out, right? Yeah, and so I came up with this idea that I was going to sail south. This was in April of ninety three. Mm. Uh, I said, I'm going to sail south and visit as many distilleries as I can mm. and learn as much as I can about this. And then maybe someday I'll have enough information I can publish a little pamphlet or something on rum. Yeah. And, hey, if I got something to sell to there tourist shops, I can make some money. Sure. And so that I took that on. I found 175 different rums on my first trip. Are you kidding me? How many distilleries is that from? 37 distilleries. Jesus. That's, that's a lot of knowledge, man. Well, Everybody doing stuff differently, I learned, right? You know, it took, took time. Yeah. And, and how, many one year, of the, how many years would you say? Because you're saying you went in there in 93 to start this voyage. Yeah, I wrote and, my first book in 95. So in two wow. years. Still, that's a lot of ground. Well, I dedicated myself to it. I sold my refrigeration tools yeah. to a friend of mine, a guy that I still see. He, he's growing pomegranates now in Florida. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, but... Uh, I said, I'm going to do this writing thing, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to commit to it. So I sold my tools yeah. and started doing it. And did you enjoy writing? I mean, you, you yeah, oh, I loved it. it did was, you ever? So outside of what was maybe for for a purpose with the, the rum bit, again, we talk about what is probably a very picturesque and scenic lifestyle. Doesn't that really encourage you? To, do you ever write about that stuff as well? No, not as much as I would like. Uh, but writing gives you a new perspective of old scenes. Mm, interesting, yeah. And it opens up your mind, opens up your eye. You see different things. Mm -hmm. And one of the kind of romantic things that I wrote uh, was that I was in, I traveled the islands in search of treasures that were overlooked by the masses. Yeah. And for over 500 years since Columbus had come, uh, to invade the islands, people had been going to the islands in search of treasure. Yeah, and sugarcane turned out to be more valuable than all the gold that was taken out of the islands. Wow, sugarcane and yeah. rum and sugar. More exotic, more value. Yeah, more valuable. Yeah, at one time, uh, sugar was worth gold. It was all, it was on par with gold. Okay, but you know, short periods of time in history and you know, different things, but. It gives you a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And the idea of you are exploring and discovering things that nobody else has seen. Right. But you go into a distillery, well, everybody's seen everything there. They're working there. They've been there for their whole life. Yeah. But you go into a distillery, say, in Guadalupe, where there's no electric lights. Everything's run off steam. And the source of the steam, the, the fire, mm. is the spent cane. So they crush the cane, collect the spent cane. Totally integrated. It's all integrated. It's amazing. And at the end of the day, at sunset, or just before sunset, they shut it down. Can't see otherwise. Can't see. Wow. 
you introduce electrical lights, electricity, you've got a source of ignition. Your chance of burning the joint down greatly increases. Yeah, that's a great point. And it was interesting to me to just sit there and listen to the steam engine turn at 50, 55 RPM mm. and see people do things and the labor and these people were no longer slaves but they worked like slaves wow. they worked hard man they worked that is hard tough. that's tough work it's got to be hot in there oh it's probably very little ventilation and hot's the good part yeah hot's well, it's, the pretty good much, part. it's pretty much open that's i mean good, it's in an open shed kind of they weren't they weren't too closed up mm. but it's dangerous uh you're working about and there's no osha uh, there's big gears, you know, a 20-foot uh, flywheel with a big gears and yeah. all this stuff. I never saw anybody get hurt, but I'm sure it happened over yeah. the years. Um, but at the end of the day, they were making a product that was woven into the history of the islands, mm. rum. And it was a part of daily life. Right. Uh, Currency. It was currency. Yeah. It was it was life itself. I mean, it, everything was celebrated with rum, mm -hmm. and it was so much alive. It was so, it was a real living piece of the islands, and everywhere you went, everybody had their favorite rum. Uh, you traveled around an island, you could tell when you were what distillery district almost you were in by what they really? were really by the advertising. Isn't that and the amazing? Rum and, think yeah, about it was that. it was pretty. Cool. Think of like down in like if in Austin, right? You go right. east side. That's what they make their own style of uh, rum. Right. I mean, it's, that's a, amazing. I would. I can't even imagine that. Yeah. But e even here, uh, you go to East Side. They're drinking different beer than they're drinking downtown. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. So, as a guy that didn't speak the language, I had to look, use my other senses, and try to figure it out. Right. Uh, it, was, it was really interesting. I really enjoyed that. Were you still staying on the boat? Like you yeah, living on the boat yeah. and sailing around. But I found that you really had to visit a distillery three times before you started to uncover and open the windows and pull back the drapes and understand. <laughs> no makeup. Yeah. And at Nissan, for example, the first time I went there, uh, one of the guys who I'm still friends with, Linus, came from St. Lucia when he was a young man, probably mm -hmm. 17, 18, 17 years old, probably 16 maybe. He came up there as a cane cutter, and he could make more money in St. Lucia than, or in Martinique than he could in St. Lucia. Wow. Now, you've recently heard about the business in Nicaragua right, and yeah. you know, Central America. Well, a cane cutter in Martinique makes about 2,400 euros a month. Wow. Real money. That's real money, yeah. I mean, we could live on that. That's right. That's a that's amazing. Real money. And it's a union job. Mm. They get benefits, sick leave, uh vacation, yeah, retirement. That's a that's a hell of a gig. Yeah. Is it real, why why is it so so structured? That, well, that is a sustainable part of the economy. Mm. Where in Central and South America and even Puerto Rico before they closed the, the sugar industry, you were labor and you were not treated as Anything other than another, disposable labor. Another raw material almost, right? You were another raw material. Wow. To be chewed up and spit out. Yeah. As waste. Yeah. Which is not that that is that is the the, the dynamic of a lot of yeah. labor. I mean yeah. I mean we are guilty of that in some capacity in the States as well. Sure. You know? Sure. And just kind of putting those people aside. But you know, to touch on that briefly with the Guatemalan bit and that was that there was some kind of causation due to un Fair labor conditions or working conditions that contributed to is it kidney cancer? Yeah, kidney? it's kidney disease, chronic kidney disease. Yeah. And the ugly truth is that those people that work for Forticania make more, I'm not gonna say considerably more because it's not a lot of money, mm -hmm. but they make more than uh, cane cutters in some of the other Central American countries. Right. And because they make a little more, they can afford to stay home. Mm -hmm. And when they stay in that village, uh, Chipigalpa, uh, Chichigalpa, near the Fort Acaña distillery, they get sick, mm -hmm. and then they're counted in the local uh, 
medical system where a guy that's a transient worker uh, doesn't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. he's, he's traveling, and if he gets sick, nobody counts him. Interesting. And so we see these tremendous spikes, and the reality is people are getting sick from chronic kidney disease all over the place, and it's not just the cane fields. Yeah. Uh, mining is another example. Uh, the ports. What work. You, what's, what's the main? Is well, it the, dehydration. The bathroom, like I'm not, not a good, doctor. Yeah, I'm curious. But your one of the things is dehydration, mm -hmm. getting enough hydration, getting enough rest. Right. Uh, your body over temperature. Ah. Which could be in any any market, any, right? Any field, you know. Right. Uh, longshoremen are susceptible to it. Miners, uh, anywhere where you're working hard and yeah. long hours. But then the other part of it is. These guys are not educated, mm -hmm. and they don't understand all the things. Right. And then you got the Latin culture, and I hate to sound uh, racist. No, maybe am, a little arrogant, right, at times? A little machismo That's in there. Right, yeah. And they have a short job cycle. Mm -hmm. It's only going to last six months, so you better get in there and work as hard as you can for six months. You ignore your, the signs of your body, right? You ignore the signs of your body. And when I was working on ships in Asia, uh, my Filipino crew, probably eight guys who worked under me, mm -hmm. uh, they did things. And, and there were times I said, guys, stop that. You're working too hard. You need to go rest. You need to They'll work themselves to death. Yeah. yeah. And I said to one of the guys, I said, why do you do this? Why do you work so hard? And he says, chief, when we get to Manila, when we get to Manila, there'll be 20 guys on the dock. If you think any of them can work harder than me, I'm gone. Wow. I said, yeah, but I know you. I know what you can do. I'm not going to take a chance on somebody. I, yeah. You know, everybody needs rest. Everybody needs uh, to cool off. And we were working in an engine room in the South China oh, Sea. God. In, sticky, uh, sticky. Yeah, it was not nice. But the guys were hard work, and they knew what they were doing. Hell, I was brought on as chief engineer. These guys have been on the ship for seven years. Right. I'm going to tell them what's going on. Yes, well, <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> the young buck coming. I yeah. Mean. You know, uh, there were some things that I did that worked out uh, better, and they, you know, they just didn't have uh, the experience that I had. We had different experiences, but we yeah. worked together as a team. But in relate as it relates to this chronic kidney disease, and chronic failure. These are people that are trying to earn a living, trying to earn as much money as they can in a short uh, labor market. Right. So very ex extenu extenuating circumstances beyond. To a degree, yeah. yeah. You're doing less but more of less. Want another beer? No, I'm good. Thank you. But how different is that from the guy that goes out and knocks him out, knocks himself out playing football? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. On the high school level, the college level, right. or even the pro level. How many guys get carried off that field every week yeah. for 16 weeks that we never hear of again? And you don't even know what kind of emotional disorders they've accum they accumulated over the and years. And that's the good part. Right. Well, the, the, that we don't know is right. Right. The I mean, suicidality. I mean, there, there's we all see of physical problems, uh, but then they retire and then. How many swept under the rug, right? Swept under the rug. How many of them have committed suicide from the effects of steroids and all these things? Yeah. And so to criticize the people that run Forticania as an example, and, and I hate to even mention that word Forticania because it's not Forticania Distillery. It's the sugar company I see. that makes the rum or makes the sugar that makes the molasses. And they're just the ones, a lot right. of just right. processing the raw material. Right. So why, why do you think they were, uh, here's an even simpler question. They were needed an easy target. Right. Why, do you think, because it was a single event and a dramatic one at that, that caused this dialogue. Now it is a good dialogue to have. Well, it's been going on for a while and people have been looking into it. Right. I was there... I don't know exactly, but I would say six, seven years ago. Mm. So I did a little research, and I knew about this chronic kidney problem, and I thought, hmm, it's probably related to insecticides and that kind of thing. And so I looked into that a little bit. And then I got down there, and I, I wish I could remember his name, but the there was one engineer that was in charge of 
the plantations, the sugar, the sugar mill, and the distillery, because they're all interrelated. Right. You right. change process perspective. Right. Like. Process perspective. You change even the cut of the sugar cane. You get more trash into the sugar mill. That's going to affect the molasses. Right. And I said, so what about this problem? You know, cane cutters and all this kind of thing. And the guy says, we could solve this tomorrow. I said, really? Wow. He says, yeah, we can just bring in a few more machines and put them all out of work. Ah. So you put a thousand people out of work, then where are you? That's right. Talk about suicidality, right? There's lots of other. What do you want to do? Right. And so the media has a tendency to always villainize. Mm-hmm. And we talked about it quite a bit over the three days that I was there. And I said, you know, that's an interesting question of do you put them all out of work? And he right. says, no, as long as people want to work, we're going to give them opportunities. We're going to say, yes, you can work. Uh, the young people don't want to, mm-hmm. as many. He says, in the old days, there were 20,000 people cutting cane. Right. He says, today we're down. we got fewer and fewer. We are bringing in machines. We are doing things. Um, one of the other things that they did was plant trees, uh, eucalyptus, around the fields. Mm -hmm. And then they harvest that eucalyptus and burn it in the distillery or in the sugar mill uh, boiler. They produced 17, back then, a few years ago, they produced 17% of Nicaragua's electricity outside the cane season. Oh, wow. During the cane season, they produced 23% of Nicaragua's electricity. So they could reduce their dependence on foreign oil. What a concept! Right. Eh? See, that's see, this is a, this is what we would call the whole picture. Right. Right. And I feel, I, and this is it's reactive, this, like all this right. media. Right. This is the second poorest country in a, in the Western Hemisphere. Right. And they're trying to better themselves, and you're going to call and you're them going out after them and calling them out. And n- they didn't fact check it. No. And there was, you know, no follow-up. Yeah. And when I was interviewed for that article, I said, is this another attempt to betray Florida Kanye as the bad guy Yeah. in this issue? And they said, oh, no, 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 no. Well, of course it was. Yeah. Uh, Why? Why them? Just easy to, because the Easy pockets? target, easy target. Yeah. Uh, and because there is a higher incidence of... Uh, kidney failure in that village right. because people have a, enough money to be able to live in one area yeah. and not be spread out and not, not be traveling all the time. Right. So it could be it, you just basically take even maybe patient zero and he just he just went back into the city. So you're not even measuring properly. Right. Because the right. eligible people to have this, right. it could actually be decreasing depending if you bring all the people in they get the full sample size, right? God, yeah. man, what, you know, that's the thing. It's like, I love learning, and I love chatting with people, and someone always knows something more, you know? Right. You've when been you there. Think, you saw it. When you think you know it all, and I saw this in Asia a lot, and guys that said, yeah, I've been over here 20 years, and I got them. I understand them. I've seen it all. And I go, yep. <laughs> well, let me get out of your way. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> None of us have seen it all. No. That would be we don't have the all purpose. the answers. All right, we don't have all the answers. Right. We have an obligation to do what we can for our fellow men mm-hmm. and women, uh, but we all have to be responsible and act responsible. Yeah. And that kind of brings me back to this whole rum industry or spirits industry and the craft industry. Yeah. I think there needs to be more responsibility in accountability. Mm-hmm. of what we're putting in bottles. Uh, right now, you can virtually put anything in a, that comes out of a still in a bottle. Right. No me- you, methanol or not. Like, you and I, I've, been, I've tweeted a couple of times uh, and said this in a few seminars, just because it comes out of a still doesn't mean you should drink it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> just because it comes out of Hollywood doesn't mean you should watch it. Right. Right. Just right. be... D- 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 be a discerning taster right because there is i love this for there's a lot of dog shit that comes out man and i'll say it, you don't even have to say it. yeah there's, some, no, there there's is. shitty rum there's shitty gin 
There's vodka shitty vodka, whiskey. which is like perplexing to me that you you would ship it in. And most of that stuff that's bulk, like I gotta tell you, it's pretty decent. It's good stuff because they yeah. know how to do it. Right. Doing it in scale and All right. But shitty whiskey. But the whiskey, guy that makes his own and. Especially when you get into something that's more complex, like whiskey, yeah. when you're fermenting your own whiskey, there's all kinds of things in there. You got a whole right. soup of stuff. Sure. And then if you don't do a good distillation, you you heighten. Methanol's the good part. <laughs> yeah. yeah the are, blindness is just the. That's... Oh, there's 13 basic uh, alcohols that are produced in fermentation. As- Acetones as well as I don't know. Yeah, that. acetone is one of them. But all these are different alcohols. Right. And then when we drink it, yeah, some of these we want. Acetaldehydes. Acetaldehydes give things light floral flavor or aromas mm-hmm. and things. But you don't want too much acetaldehyde. Right. You want a little bit, but not too much. Uh, acetone. Yeah, you don't want much acetone. But a little bit goes a long way. Sure. Uh, and then you get into the heavier alcohols, and a little bit adds flavor and yeah. body, and then it helps it age better. Mm-hmm. And it depends on whether you're going to age this product or not. A lot of aged products you should not be drinking fresh. Yeah, it's uh, not where they tick on their their true personality yet. Right. Uh, the the five year old pot still rum that I do, five year old is the youngest that I will drink it. Yeah, I tried it at four. It's too green. I tried it at three, mm. and at two, I said, "Oh my god!" Almost undrinkable, right? I, yeah, I don't. I, I don't want to drink this. Now, fresh out of the still, it was interesting. It was almost exciting. Yeah, here's something fresh out of the still, mm. and it, it's coming off the still at eighty-two percent alcohol, which right. you can't drink much of it, fortunately. Yeah, because uh, you taste it. Just stick your finger in it and taste it, and you go, "Oh." Well, that's interesting. Yeah. If you actually took a sip of that, it'd probably make you quit drinking it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't say it'd make you, you sick, yeah. but offensive. It needs to be aged, mm. and like some wines. I mean, we talk about the Beaujolais Nouveau or right, right. the Novo uh, Novo wines that come out in the fall. You expect them to be horrible. They're the first ones out of out of the year of the right. year, and you think yes, but you know we'll let that age for two years or mm-hmm. something, and then in, oh wow that's pretty good, right? And we have a tendency to think that if we go through all the expense of building a distillery and getting in the licenses and mm-hmm. doing all these things, and then whatever comes out of that still, it's got to be good. It's got to be good, and we've invested so much in it that we can't afford to throw it away. Yeah. Well, and, Should, you can't, and you can't afford to do an analysis on it and run it through a gas chromatograph. That costs real money. Mm-hmm. But the big distilleries do that on every batch. Yeah. And you need to really understand what you're drinking and where it's coming from and what's going in it. And uh, Tobacco is something that... Uh, forms all kinds of carcinogens with alcohol. The alcohol leaches things out of the tobacco really? okay. that we shouldn't be drinking. Yeah, and I've seen a couple of things that oh, it's made with tobacco. Uh, that's okay. No thanks. <laughs> I'm a non-smoker. I'm already dying. Smoking. Yeah, I, I quit smoking. Stuff. I don't need any. Yeah, exactly. Well, so you so going back to the book, you said it took two years from '93 to '95 published, and that's your first one published in '95. What was that first book called? Uh, Rum's the Eastern Caribbean. And then I did another one in '97, and then that got that book got picked up by a publisher in Chicago. Wow! And I added a few chapters to that, and it got published as the Complete Guide to Rum, or the Incomplete Guide to Rum, as I like to call it. Yeah. And then that got uh, published in German as Das Rumbach. I like this. That sounds and, much tougher. Yeah, it's a tough book. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I lost my copy of that. Oh no! I, yeah. Are you able? To, can you find another one? Uh, I was given a copy last year when I was in uh, Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. A guy had it, and he didn't know how much it was worth on Amazon, and he gave it to me. And And you didn't uh, either, because you lost it. Well, I knew I I couldn't afford it. Yeah. Uh, But anyway, I I was given a copy, so I have a copy of that. And I'm looking to do another book 
uh, but this whole importing thing has just gotten to be way too busy. And, yeah. um, when did it first? When did you first start? As well, I got my license in two thousand three. Mm -hmm. My first sale was in January two thousand five mm -hmm. in San Francisco with Rum Agricole, ah. and uh, then I struggled with that for about eight years, seven eight years. How many SKUs were you working with at that point? Uh, six. Six. And you started had with six. And then I added sugarcane syrup, and then a few years later I added the Duquesne rums, mm -hmm. the Blanc and the Elevé Soubois, which that's kind of an aside. Uh, Duquesne, the distillery, would not sell me, and I went to all the distilleries in Martinique, mm -hmm. and they knew who I was, they knew me, and they knew that I'd written a book about French rum in English. Yeah. And they were all perplexed because the, the French government had actually spent money trying to figure out how to market rum agricole in America. Yeah. So Bacardi had just bought Grey Goose for two billion dollars wow. and change. Right. And a couple extra million and change. And uh, Sidney Frank had a bunch of money and was running around Martinique and other places. Mm -hmm. So I'm running around trying to buy half a container of rum so that I can consolidate a container. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a twenty foot container. Which okay. It's okay. like eight hundred cases, seven, yeah. eight hundred cases. So I'm trying to do small amounts. And one day they said to me, one day they said to me, Ed, you don't get it. What's going on here? You want to buy half a container. Mm -hmm. This guy over here, and he showed me an email from Sidney Frank's office. Uh, they want to buy 10 containers. And I said, yes, but the difference is I will be back. Ah. You will give them an or, uh, a quote on 10 containers. They'll buy two. You'll never see them again. What were they trying to put out? Uh, they wanted to put out a rum agricole, and they were convinced that rum was the next thing. Yeah. This is 2004. I worked hard, talked to the distilleries, and said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Done There's, deal. Like, I, you, I am going to do this. I am going to do this. I had the money. A businessman had given me the money. He had been drinking tea punches at a, <laughs> at a party one night, and basically gave me, uh, well, he did, he gave me a, a letter of credit with his bank. And back in 2003, letters of credit were cheap. Yeah. Uh, gave me a letter of credit, and I went to the islands and started buying rum. But they, the French were very, very particular, and they did not want to be part of my portfolio if Nissan or La Favorite were in my portfolio. I see, okay. So one day I said, okay, you only want me to buy your rum if I don't buy theirs. Do you only want me to sell this to bars, restaurants, liquor stores that only sell your rum? I say here in Martinique, the supermarket sells everything. But right, right. So you're, you're, you're that far. You're a meter from Nissan and less than a meter from La Favorite. Right. But I can't sell. I said, I'll, I'll go broke if I only sell your rum. Yeah. Your rum's not that good. <laughs> And uh, one of the questions I ask everybody is, what makes this the best rum in the world? Mm -hmm. And Duquesne told me, no, we're not the best in the world. But we have good price, we're good quality, we can... And I said, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, they were adamant that they would not do business with me if I had Those these other rums in, yeah. in the portfolio. Two years later, well... When my first container left in November of 2004, it turned out it was a big deal. It was the first container of rum to leave Martinique destined for the U.S. In the past, everything had gone to France. Oh, uh, wow, okay. A pallet of St. James here and there yeah, and that kind yeah. of thing. And uh, it was on the news that night. No shit. And uh, different film crews had been running around. I'd been there for years, yeah. and so I'd done a lot of interviews and I didn't know. Yeah. I was on my boat getting drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a big day. Yeah. You know? That's amazing. Historic. Yeah, it was historic. Well, I didn't have a TV and certainly wasn't tuned to a French station, so I didn't know. So the next morning uh, when I rode to shore, uh, there were some guys standing there, and I recognized them as I got closer to them. And they said, oh, uh, Ed, we have to go have lunch. And I said, you know, it's only 10 o'clock, and I got work to do. I yeah. got papers and all kinds of stuff. So I went to a little cyber cafe where I was doing my uh, kind of my office there in Martinique on the south coast. And 
I said, well, just wait for me. And uh, they went to another little place, had coffee, and half an hour later I went down, oh, Ed, you must, you must. And I said, hey, I don't have any money. Mm -hmm. I, I spent my money, and I'm, I'm on my way. And they said, oh, but, but. And I said, no, it's too late. I can't do it. So two years later, Duquesne came back to me, and I'd become good friends with the uh, director general of the company. Mm. And uh, just before he left Martinique to go back and do another job in France, he said, I want you to take Duquesne. And I said, okay, I'll take it, but I don't want any marketing money. Mm -hmm. I don't want any allowances for marketing. Give me your best price. And they did. And today, Duquesne is the least expensive rum agricole, AOC rum agricole in America. Oh, wow. So you negotiated that based on that model, right? Based on that model. Yeah. And then uh, the Duquesne Elevé Sous Bois is the one I wanted. Mm -hmm. And uh, that goes into a lot of tiki drinks. Mm -hmm. uh, three Dots and a Dash in Chicago, yeah. you probably know of them. Mm -hmm. Well, their eponymous drink in the top left of their menu is Three Dots and a Dash. Yeah. Is uh ounce and a half or so of Duquesne Elevé Sous Bois. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a good rum. It's... Uh, aged martinique rum at a good price yeah. and so that works out really well for me and it keeps things going i just ordered another container at duquesne today that's incredible yeah so you man it's it's crazy because you know if i talk to someone that's in their 20s i got a lot less there's a lot less material because there's so much more life that they have left to live but i mean to even just recap up to this point you quit your job as an engineer even though you didn't have to you wanted to sail, you did. You worked in Asia on ships, you worked in the gas fields, you worked in oil, you wrote two fucking books. Uh, did you ever date a movie star? Uh, I didn't date her, <laughs> but I taught a movie star how to sail. Oh, really? Yeah. Was, it, was this in the 80s, the 90s? Uh, 79, something like that. Someone I might know? Yeah, I won't mention her name. but Good relationship, though? Yeah, it was pretty good. It yeah. was pretty good. Uh, I was teaching sailing at a little sailing school in Marina del Rey. Ah, okay. And uh, she came in one day and wanted to learn how to sail. That's amazing. Yeah, See, so. that's so I just knew it had to be in there somewhere. Some celebrity <laughs> in the life that ha it had to be. Well, you hang around LA long enough, and you know you got a boat. Great. You got your own boat. People will flock, I guess. Well, things happen. No, I was teaching sailing on somebody else's oh, boat that was at that time. Else's. Yeah, I didn't yeah. have a boat at that time, but. Uh, yeah, there's all kinds of opportunities. Yeah, I'm really lucky now. Uh, I live. I spend a lot of time. And I'm not a resident of California. Mm -hmm. I can't can't afford to. Uh, but my business is based in Florida. I left Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, business is based in Florida, but I spend a lot of time in Southern California. And California is still about twenty percent of my business, oh, my really? import business. Okay. Um, do you have a, Do you have a house out there? You have a no family, but, is but uh, I have. A, uh, girlfriend yeah and actually it's wendell rankin's uh well I don't know. she is oh she's his widow oh he passed away a few years ago four years ago mm -hmm. and uh i had been in touch with him and seen him she took care of him for 12 years while he had a long illness and uh i saw her a few years ago and asked her are you doing okay anything you need you're an angel. You took care of my good friend for right. 12 years. Wow. And uh, we, he and I were really close, good friends. And She said, yeah, um, I'm doing okay. Um, I said, well, anything I can do for you? She says, yeah, come live with me. Just needed the, I mean, probably had a great house, right? Yeah, so they had a house. And so uh, we live in Southern California, and uh, I live with her. And Amazing. Uh, spend a lot of time with her. I can't say I live with her because for tax reasons. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to don't incriminate myself. You live in the island somewhere, yeah, really, somewhere. right? Yeah, but uh, still no, still no chance of the kids in the three point two or the three point two. No, kids. no, no. She's my age, but it's it's amazing because years ago in Taiwan, she used to go to the boat yards with us. No kidding. And so you knew she, yeah, I've known her thirty seven years. Wow. And both of us were dirt poor at that time. Yeah. But. Oh, we literally didn't have taxi money. You know, we took buses everywhere. Amazing. But we would go to the boat yards with Wendell, and uh, she was in the back seat, and she'd get madder in hell because she thought we were talking about her. <laughs> okay. And I remember several times telling Wendell, you know, she's so sweet, and she's a great woman. 
uh, but I'm so <laughs> glad that I don't have to deal with her every day. <laughs> we still don't, luckily, right? And, You're traveling uh, so much. Well, she generally travels with me. Oh, good. Uh, she's retired, and so typically she travels with me. Her yeah. sister's in town right now from oh, cool. Taiwan. She's got four sisters, and uh, her father is 93 years old. Still and, kicking it? Yeah. It, wow. He's, he's amazing. So uh, her nephew... Yeah, nephew is graduating with a PhD in material sciences from the University of Illinois oh, wow. in May. And so her father's coming over from Taiwan. But her father escaped from China uh, in 45, 46. Oh, that's tough. Yeah. And came over as part of Chiang Kai shek's group to, uh, he worked in the sugar mills in Taiwan and. Uh, the Japanese had just gotten thrown out. The Japanese left in 50, uh -huh. uh, 1950. They'd been there since, I think, 1890, something like that, wow. maybe 1888. But anyway, the Japanese left, and then her father was running the managing and doing administrative things in the sugar mills in Taiwan. Isn't that strange, though? Yeah, you can't, how it ties wild. back to that? It's pretty wild. So Taiwan back then had 35 sugar mills. Today wow. they have three. That's a big change would why the shift just not uh, economy lucrative. yeah yeah the economy wow and w we see it in america i mean uh puerto rico shut down their sugar mills in 2000 trinidad shut in 2000 um most of the other uh, i don't know, about the same time or within a couple of years of that in the 80s and 90s we got away from sugar and got into all kinds of uh synthetic sweeteners and now we're talking about natural sweeteners but they're all modified and all yeah. this kind of stuff and now people are starting to recognize that sugar may be bad for you but how about moderation that's never bad for you unless it's whiskey in my opinion <laughs> <laughs> or rum i suppose yeah. yeah so you know use it in moderation i look at it like uh butter oh. i love butter yeah i don't use any margarine i oh. use a little butter Good. And, and I can count the ingredients. Right. It's all very simple. Right. And so I look at transparency of production. Mm -hmm. I'm an engineer. If you can't tell me what's in it or how you made it, mm, <laughs> I think I'll pass. And fortunately, today there are a lot of options in the bar. Yeah. A lot uh, of good options. A lot of good options. Better than ever, I'd say. Better than ever. Uh, you know, the beer industry has gone crazy. Yeah. There's a lot of beers that I don't really enjoy. They give me a hangover, and I know that there's congeners in there and things. And yeah, okay, you got your organic fruit this or, or that, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, this or that. But what else are you putting in there? Yeah, it's. It, does it? Do you ever feel like? I, I I think about this in music when when I first started learning how to play guitar. I couldn't listen to music the same ever again. Because I was like, oh, that's what he's playing. Before, it was just this big box, right? I did this big Pandora's box. I didn't understand. It was a curtain. I, I didn't understand how that stuff worked. But then, once I started playing guitar, I understood every police song then. And then it's, it changes stuff. Right. So, does it ever feel knowing way more than anybody I'll ever meet about booze, about production, fermentation, all of those things, does it ever take kind of the raw curiosity out of it? No. <laughs> no, good, good. Yeah. Uh, I'm always looking. Well, it's it's a lot like. When you start writing, like being a musician, yeah. you yeah. listen to music differently, you view it differently, you analyze it differently, right. you hear it differently. Totally different. Totally sort of different. Lens. Totally lens, different. Yeah. When you write. And I don't do this as much as I used to because it's been a while since I've written any books. Uh, but you read things differently. And what was he thinking? How did he structure this sentence, this paragraph, this thought? This. And now when I taste a rum, I want to be able to see everything that happened in this and yeah. what, what, would, what went into this and how and, you know, and where does this note come from and how does that work? And I feel like I'm fortunate to have an engineering background so that I understand a lot of 
the nuances right. and things. That's actually, I like that part about spirits. It's like, oh, I can taste this, and this is why right. this happened. Right. You know, a lot of people don't have that blo- that benefit. But experience. I also recognize that I don't understand it all. That's great, yeah. And there are a lot of things. But there is magic. There is this magic, you know. Some spirits just have that. So you've, I, I mean, honestly, man, it, it seems like you've done, you've done so much shit. I, you know, I've just, I've learned a lot. I'm an old guy, you know, I've had a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> You've been around the track a few times, right? Yeah. So what what else is left to do? Oh, there's a lot left. Uh, What's next? Man? Something that you well, really I, want. Well, I'm going to continue to grow the brand. Uh, there's a lot of other rums that I want to bottle. Yeah. Um, I want to do some more traveling. I want to do, uh, I want to write another book or two or three. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what I've written in the past, the timing was horrible. Um I sold the books that I printed. I wish that I had books today yeah. to sell. Because that's got a lot of mar- a big market now. Mo- lo- well, more larger than, market. Yeah. Right, more than there was in 95. Uh, although in 95, I said I never sold a book. I sold a Caribbean gift. <laughs> and I put stickers on them, signed Caribbean edition. And that, I signed. That thing is on eBay right now for tens of thousands of dollars. Isn't well, it? They're, they're not tens of thousands, but... <laughs> <laughs> there are, but, you know, but you have an idea, which right. makes that you know. Well, there are a few hundred dollars. Yeah, that's a, a lot. Hundred. That's a, yeah. Think yeah. It, your a your book, book that, for a twenty dollar book. How's yeah. that feel? That's pretty. I don't get. I don't have a book on eBay for a couple <laughs> hundred bucks. <laughs> uh, no, I've seen them for nine hundred. That's incredible. That's yeah. a collectible. Yeah, it's collectible. You know, I wish I had the next book, and. I would like to include the domestic s- s- distillers, but mm-hmm. there's no way to do that. Yeah, it just—it's S- impossible. So much work, right? New new ones every every week. New ones every week, yeah. and you have to go through all the bullshit. Yeah, and you know people tell you things that aren't true. Yeah, have you they noticed know it's that? Not true. <laughs> yeah, fucking right. I've noticed that. I've had people like sit here right in front of me, and I know they're just being disingenuous on purpose. I mean. What do you think I'm going to do with this information? Why would you lie about it? You know, right? right. But it's, a, it's a pathological for some. They just have to do it. And distilling—that's the one. You know, to just be open about it. Everybody's going to appreciate that more. And the, well, the truth is, I can tell you the recipe, and you're going to distill it, and it's going to come out different. Totally different, right? Trade secrets? What trade secrets? It's yeah, the way we the yeast. It. The yeast is going to is a trade secret, and right. I respect that. Sure. Uh, <laughs> or where you get your raw materials. Right. That's a trade secret. There's some variability. I, I wrote that. years ago that there's a little bit of magic in every bottle of rum. Mm-hmm. And if I told you everything about it, it'd no longer be, be magic. magic. Yeah. And I was asking uh, in Trinidad, I was there a few years ago, and uh, they were asking, well, what's next? And I said, well, I'm bottling rums from distilleries. And I'm making it all transparent. Yeah. And they said, well, you won't get any rum from us. We can't do that. And we wow. can't tell you everything. And I said, what do you mean? And uh, finally one of the engineers there that helped me in the technical part of my first book said, well, you wrote it years ago. There's a little bit of magic in every bottle. And if uh-huh. we tell you, and all of us together said, it will no longer be magic. And I thought, Wow. That is, that's beautiful. That, yeah. There's, that's a, I mean, to have something to, to influence people through something that they've read more than 15 years ago. Yeah. And for them to remember and accept it. Well, it's kind of, kind of neat. Um, yeah, I'm lucky. I, but. It's not done yet. Better to be lucky than good. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, I hope that the rest of the Texas trip, I think you're off to. San Antonio tomorrow with Matt, the fine Matt Daniels. It's good, man. And you, I love it because you're, you're just a humble guy. You know, I don't feel like I could, you'll tell me exactly what you think about whatever. And that's, that's a really amazing thing. I think a lot of people lose that. Yeah. You, well, you have to be careful. You can't say exactly how you feel about everything. Right. And I'm learning that. Um, I've tried really hard to educate people as opposed to, uh, and I've said things about other brands and, People, oh, you shouldn't say that. Yeah. Well, as long I I feel like as long as I tell the truth and can back it up or ask questions to get you to question 
what is the authenticity of that? Is that really the way you do it? Yeah. How, you know, what, and get there's more tactful ways. Right, right. And yeah. I'm learning that. I'm not the most tactful guy. Uh, That's a good thing. But, but I'm learning. Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> but, We're both um, I, it. I appreciate coming to Texas. Uh, the bartending community in Texas has been phenomenal. And I don't say that because I'm sitting in Austin. Right. It's just it. It's great. great it's people. a great. And people tend to discount the intelligence and the inquisitive nature of bartenders. Yeah. And it's amazing how many of the people that we deal with every day have college degrees uh, in all kinds of things, whether it's English writing, literature, uh, engineering, or philosophy, or whatever it is. But they've chosen this craft, and they want to do it, and they want to create something. It's more than a means to get through college. Right. This is career. This is a career. Yep. And in a place like Austin, where the standards of education are pretty high, uh, there is a lot of that inquisitive nature. And I see the quality in the retailers and the bars. Oh, yeah. uh, and I think maybe, maybe it's because the people in Texas are, I don't like to say more cynical, but they're more inquisitive. Sure. And Quiz they, is a good way to put it. They want to learn. They want to understand what's going on. They want to have all the information. Give me all the information. I might not understand it all now, but... I'll work on it. I'll work on it. Yeah. So I will continue to put as much information as I can on my website and show people. And then be open. You know, if people have got a question, email me or something, and I'll try my best to answer it. I've been accused, I was accused recently of uh, doing a half-hour seminar that was over their head. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, sorry. It's better than being <laughs> under your ass, I suppose, right? Sorry, I'm tall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it, it's been just really amazing chatting with you, man. And I, you're the, it, You have illustrated the kind of life that I think a lot of people dream about in a, in a lot of ways. And to wrap it in rum and wrap it in the passion for spirits in the world and just keeping things simple it's almost a, a counterintuitive approach with how fascinated and how obsessed people are with money right now. Yeah, like it's that, you know? well, I've been fortunate. Yeah. Had a lot of good mentors. It, it, I think you're pa paying that forward and being a good mentor to others as well, man. So thank you for the beer. Thanks so you're much welcome. for chatting. Talk soon. Well, there we have it. Everything you wanted to know about rum, but perhaps were afraid to ask with the wonderful Ed Hamilton Honestly, one of those moments sitting in a East Side hotel room, sipping beer with Ed and chatting about his world travels, chatting about the misconceptions about certain rums and how pouring it down the drain is misconceived, ill-fated. But I hope you guys learned something about rum there. I hope you learned a tad about the terroir. Ed is such a brainiac. He understands every piece of the production, you know, his candid attitude, gruffness at times, but that is what makes him all the more charming. So thanks everybody for listening to Show to V with Mike G. And thank you for contributing and participating in Rum Week at Show to V. First, Anya Robbins of House of Agricole. And today with Ed Hamilton, the Ministry of Rum. And those Ed Hamilton pot stilled rums are funky, crazy, fresh, but absolutely delicious. So regardless of which of those pot stilled rums you're looking to try next, or if you're really looking forward to cleaning the kettle at the distillery here in about 30 minutes, Please keep dancing.